So um, it's, it's a lot. Um, how's it sitting so far? Good. Good? <laughs> Was that Penny? <laughs> it sounded like Penny. <laughs> yeah. Um, any, any of the parts so far that you kind of wanted to kind of go back to it all, or are you ready to, to go into some new stuff? If I could, and it could be for another session and I can take offline and do my own reading about it and for all, all sentient beings, it's like, what about animals and my little fur baby, which was causing me havoc here this morning, um, you know, you know, in their passing and I feel bad if I haven't done something right for my animals as well. Yeah. And I'm happy to take that offline and read on my own time, if any direction, books or anything. No, no, it's a good question. Um, I'm sure lots of people have similar questions and it's, it's a pretty short answer. So yeah, good one um, for babies. Um, so first thing is know that all of the years of kindness that you give to your animals are reinforcing a positive relationship. Yeah, and so when you meet again, you're gonna like each other. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so whatever form that you bump into each other, again, it's going to be like, I like you, I'm not sure why. Um, and they're going to be like, I like you too, and I, I'm hungry, I'm not sure why. No, I'm kidding, but um, <laughs> they're going to like you, right? And so what you want to do with that relationship is think, this is kind of a relationship that when they're in animal form is kind of like dormant or in stasis in terms of their spiritual development but your relationship development is really active and really powerful because you're in each other's lives every day and you're doing all sorts of generosity by feeding them and making them safe and giving them love and so you know the four forms of generosity you've got three out of four just every day yeah, you've got um, material generosity, right? Loving kindness, generosity, and offering freedom from fear. What's missing is offering them Dharma. And of course, they don't care <laughs> if you tell them about the Heart Sutra, but they love you. So if you tell them the Heart Sutra, they'll be like, well, I like you, so I'll hang out with you. And then they get the imprint for that. So things that you can do that have no like immediate effect on them necessarily, unless they've got a lot of merit, is to, to say your prayers that you normally do or your sadhanas that you normally do, say them out loud. It's good for your own verbal merit, but it's good for them because it plants seeds. Yeah, and it gives them imprints. So then when they meet those teachings in the future, when they're in a human form, they'll not be as hard. Yeah, it'll have a familiarity to it. Um, you know, there's lots of stories of, you know, the bird that was outside the window when a great master was reciting a sutra again and again, and he always missed one chapter. And so then when he was a human, he, he did well with all the chapters, except for the one he always missed when he was a bird and flew off to get food. <laughs> but the other ones came a lot easier for him. So the main for baby project is keep loving on them and lots of imprints. So, you know, um, tell them the mantras that you know. They don't care, but it's good for them, <laughs> you know? Like I was telling the horses about Omani Pemehum the other day and they were just like, snort, where's my hay? But <laughs> they hung around because hay could come at any time. So they heard all sorts of mantras, you know? So it's, it's like, you know, stealth imprints. It's a, a good way for them to plant seeds, yeah? And then when they're dying, um, whatever you can do to make their minds peaceful, um, a little bit of morphine, a little bit of painkillers, you know, things like that, 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 you know, kind of take the edge off their pain are completely fine, right? Just like they are for people. So we don't have to think that we're somehow, I don't know, interfering with their karma by giving them painkillers. That's fine. They have the merit for painkillers to work. You might as well be a condition. Yeah. Um, you know, if you've put down your pets in the past, I'm sure it was from a compassionate motivation. Now that we know better, um, don't do it anymore, <laughs> right? Don't do it anymore. And any of the animals that you have put down in the past, you can really bring them to mind when you do like a medicine Buddha practice and think, whenever we meet again, um, may you feel safe with me and may I interrupt the habit of thinking that killing is ever a good idea. Yeah, because of course, we think that we're putting them out of their suffering, and that's why we put them down, isn't it? Because we love them so much, we don't want them to suffer. 
what we're actually doing is planting the killing karma on our mental continuum, which will result in a shortened life for us in future. And, you know, is, uh, it's actually quite heavy. And of course, it's less heavy if you're motivated by compassion, which of course we usually are. But um, to really think this is actually a very negative seed for me to carry. And then from their side, you're not actually taking their suffering. You're just kind of putting it on pause and it will just continue in whatever next life they have. So you haven't really saved them from anything. You just kind of shifted its form. So if you can think in the future, it's better they suffer with me loving them and giving them imprints for dharma and giving them some painkillers and just loving on them it's a much better way for them to die than for me to kind of force them into another life prematurely and then they have to suffer and they might not have someone like me to look after them you know and however they're reborn so don't have like don't have a shame flood or a guilt flood if you have put down your animals in the past purify Vajrasattva, four opponent powers, decide not to do it again. And then when you do Medicine Buddha and other practices, just think of them and think wherever you are, may it go well between us in future. Wherever you are, may I only benefit and never harm. You know, and it, it, don't worry, you know, like it's not like you're ruining their Buddha nature, right? They always have Buddha nature. And um, so like that, yeah. So from a Buddhist perspective, we don't ever kill anything right? Never on purpose. Um, and of course, we weren't always Buddhist, right? So we made choices that made sense at the time. Yeah, so that's the, that's the fur baby answer. Does anyone have any fur baby follow-ups? Hey, I have a question. Sure. Um, I have two that aren't my, um, my fur babies, <laughs> and they're both quite ill. I have a photo of them in the morning. Sorry, you, you have a photo of them, did you say? It's okay. A little bit upset. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. We, yeah, tissues by all means. We're all with you. I think we're all total softies and we love our babies so much. And right now with the, the COVID especially, because we're home with them and they're just like our besties, you know, and um, I'm totally... Um, taking my, my parents' cats and deciding they're mine. Um, but um, please, please don't feel bad about past choices you made that might have not been skillful. We're brought up in a certain culture and we do things with the best of motivations and those motivations have power, you know, and feel reassured by that. And you haven't hurt them. You know, it's just, you interrupted a process. We interrupt each other's processes all the time. It's not the end of the world. And you'll meet again. And there was so many, so much more time of love than there was of mistakes. So, so feel some reassurance about that. Yeah. And when you meet again, they're just going to be like, oh, it's you. I love you so much. What's your name? <laughs> yeah. Just like in this life, sometimes when we meet people for the first time, you have that immediate heart connection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, <laughs> yeah. And um, Teresa is saying that her cat loves to practice with her in the morning. Yeah. It's, it, they really can get amazing habits from us if we kind of include them into our practice. So even if, you know, your kitty likes to sit with you on your meditation cushion and they're a little bit distracting still, you know, you're like, all right, all right. <laughs> Come, it's good for your imprints. Yeah, and, and have the feelings, right? Um, certainly the Buddhist crowd is going to be very sympathetic to you feeling like um, animal losses are real losses. You know, some people don't understand, but you'll, you'll have lots of um, friends in a Buddhist crowd who are like, yep, <laughs> that was an important relationship and that loss is worth acknowledging. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. They're still alive, both of them. Um, but I have a photo of them next to me when I'm doing my practice in the morning. Are they able to get the imprints that way? Not, not in that way, but definitely what you're doing is you're reinforcing the positive relationship that you had. Yeah, so they're not getting the direct benefit of your practice if they're not physically in the room with you, but they are getting a benefit of you reinforcing your habits of care and love for them. And that'll really ripen in a beautiful way when you meet again. 
And for you, it's a really wonderful practice because you're reinforcing loving kindness and compassion and not doing your practice just for yourself. You're reinforcing this idea of you're always doing your practice for others, specifically these ones that you've loved, but of course all sentient beings. Yeah, and there is a case occasionally where if, um, if a being has taken a rebirth in like a spirit realm or something like that, that they might actually be able to still hear you if you're doing your practice and they're hanging around. But the advice from the Buddhist perspective is if there are spirit beings around you to actually not give them too much attention because it's not a really great rebirth. You kind of, you know, it's better if they kind of live that out and then get reborn human or something else. And sometimes when they're in a spirit realm, they can be a little bit disruptive. So if you have a sense that there's other beings in the room, just kind of wish them well and disengage. Don't give it energy. Yeah. And also don't feed any kind of like superstitions you might have because maybe they aren't there and you're just kind of like living out some memories or living out some projections. And it's so hard to know what is your projection and what is actually happening. But we can kind of attract negative stuff if we think about that realm too much. So just don't give it energy. Just think if there's someone else here that I can't see, may you be well, may you be happy and back to what I'm doing. Yeah, don't give it too much energy. But if there if there are beings around, they all, they benefit from your practice. That's for sure. Just you know, think of all sentient beings. Don't get paranoid about you know anything that you can't see, because also the Buddhas you can't see, and they're with you always. Yeah, and they're supporting you always. Yeah, I see a hand. Yeah, hi, Yunzin. It's Kate here. Kate. <laughs> Um, Yunsen, my question is about the guru at the time of death and that idea of reliance. Um, you know, it's, I suppose it's very closely related to the year dam, you know, that idea where in the state of extreme suffering you have reliance as part of refuge, so you might put your head in the lap of the year dam, say. But I've always been a bit confused about that and that Christian idea of a God and, you know, the point of death and that, that idea of the relationship with the guru or the year dam. Mm. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's tricky because um, at the time of death, tantric practice, if you're a tantric practitioner, is really ideal. It's really, really ideal if you can do some of your tantric practice, especially guru yoga. Um, the, you know, a lot of you have read that prayer calling the guru from afar. And it talks about all the different ways that the guru manifests. And towards the end, there's the, pra- there's the verse that says please bless me to meet the ultimate Lama, the bare face of my innate mind, with the coverings of true existence and perceiving it as true removed. And so when we're thinking of the Yidam and the Guru deity, we're thinking, yes, of something external, not godlike, but omniscient. And we're, but we're really thinking about the potentiality of our own mind to awaken. And what we're thinking is that the Guru Buddha, which is always present, which can take the form of my yidam or can just exist as a concept of teacherness above the crown of my head, what that is is a powerful condition for my own mental development. It's not the cause. You know, and that's the difference between Buddhism and other religions is we're not thinking, Guru Buddha, save me, God, save me, forgive me. We're not thinking any of that. We're thinking this idealized object, this embodiment of everything I value, connecting with that brings my mind into that state. You know, my mind has the ability to go into that state and it helps for me to personify and externalize the perfected version of that, just as a mental exercise, but also to remember it does exist, quote, out there. There are beings who have perfected their mind, who have actualized the enlightened state of enlightenment. So it's like thinking of them as a powerful condition rather than a cause. You're the cause. Your mind is the cause. But um, thinking of them in that way, it draws your mind into the right synchronization, I think. So I don't know if that helps. Yeah. It's... um. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh describes emptiness, um, form as empty, em- emptiness as form in the Heart Sutra in this kind of beautiful poetic way where he says, um, form is the wave and emptiness is the water. And I think that's a good way of also thinking about 
um, the Dharmakaya and the specific Buddhas. Right? So it's like there's the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas, like an ocean, you know, an ocean of minds that have perfected themselves. And then they take the shape or the wave, you know, of this or of that, that's going to be relatable to us and is emphasizing certain powers and energies and traits that are where our mind is already trending. And so, you know, for some people having a beautiful green lady embodying protection and action pulls their mind towards that. And for some people, blue and medicinal and blah, 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 right? So, so it's like the form and the representation is important. It is. But remember that it's like water in a wave. Yeah, so, um, yeah, if that helps. But that's getting, yeah, getting into fun tantra business. Um, thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, yeah, others, other stuff that's come up so far or that you wanted to revisit? So I thought to go a little bit into um, just briefly some um, kind of easy go-to ways to get the mind oriented towards death, but then to go more in depth into the eight stages. So, um, so that's what we'll go into now. So in terms of meditations um, to prepare yourself for death, um, you know, with internal activities, don't forget how powerful impermanence is, even though it's very simple intellectually. And there's a lot of framings for an impermanence meditation. But basically, you could do just the classic impermanence meditation, which is just reflecting on the fact that things change. Okay, and so what do you do? You think in the natural world, you know, water flowing, cliffs eroding, this happening, that happening, just really basic stuff that you know, but bring it to mind. And then think about the way in which relationships change over time and significance of things changes over time, and this and that, and this and that, until your mind really feels reoriented to the fact of change, rather than it just being an intellectual thing that you know. And what that does is it allows you to then relax into the fact of that, yeah? And so whether you use logic or memories or science, to reinforce what you already know, which is that things change, you do it in such a way that it has the ring of truth again, so that you're not kind of sliding back into that old habit of grasping at permanence, or expecting stability, or assuming some sort of um, continuation of things to be the same day to day. So it's like your very knowledge itself protects you from unrealistic fantasies and makes you more patient and joyful. And so, you know, the example that, that some of you guys hear me say all the time is like the way in which you make friends when you're on holiday. Yeah, so if you're on holiday and you're only going to be in, you know, Greece for two weeks, you might, you know, start to make friends with some of the storekeepers and some of the coffee shop waiters and, you know, some of the people in the general area. And if you're traveling by yourself, those strangers become like your circle of friends and they become like your family. And you might even have totally deep and profound conversations with them, real heart connections. But in the back of the mind, you know, I'm going soon, yeah? And so um, you just really enjoy them with this background knowledge of, we're not always gonna be in each other's lives like this. Yeah, you know that kind of traveling mentality that you can get into where you're leaning into the present so much and it feels so rich, but you don't have this grasping and this clinging because you're just totally aware of change. So if we can have traveler mentality when we're not traveling, yeah. And, you know, it's a similar thing with any of our relationships that we're particularly attached to. If in the back of our mind, we're thinking, this conversation will never happen again in this way. This cup of tea will never happen again. You might have many more cups of tea, but not this one. You might have many more conversations, but not this one. Then things take on the preciousness they deserve, but also the letting go that they deserve. So, so don't underestimate the power of just plain old impermanence meditation. Just come back to, let me just watch the change of my own breath moment to moment, the change of my own body, the change of my own mind. Give myself back this knowledge because then you naturally get back into that letting go mind. 
Okay, so that's one. And then the other one is the classic love versus attachment. Yeah, <laughs> love good, attachment bad. Yeah, quick reminder. But through the lens of impermanence, okay? So remembering that when you're full of attachment, you're not usually remembering change. Yeah, and when you're full of attachment, things are kind of happy and joyful and tempting and uh, draw you. And if you think in your past about, you know, relationships to people or objects or situations that were full of attachment, what happens over time is there's a disappointment. Right. So in the moment when you're forgetting about impermanence, there's this, I must have you, I must have this, I must have this. Right. There's that like need and that it must be this way. This is the cause of my happiness. But then if you're remembering what always happens with attachment is that time goes by, the full story is seen, disillusionment arises, and then comes anger or depression. Right? Attachment. Right? <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, whereas with love, you know, when it's just the genuine wish for others to have happiness, in the beginning, it might be kind of mild and kind of gentle, and you don't even notice how powerful it is. But then over time, as you think of some of the friendships that you've had for years and years, you know, just the, the depth and the contentment and the stability of when there's been a friendship that's primarily been motivated by love. And, you know, the thing about trying to get rid of attachment is that if you can move your attachment off of the relationship, when someone dies, it's a totally different experience. Yeah, when it's love and not attachment, you haven't given the person all of the power to give or take your happiness. You've seen them as a condition for happiness, but you haven't given them the credit for being the cause because they weren't. So then you don't fall into the trap of thinking, I can only be happy if they're here. Because of course you can be happy if they're not there. You were happy many days when they were not in your house. You were happy many days before you met them. You know, it's like their presence was not the cause of your happiness. It never was. But attachment says it is. Therefore, when they're gone, you're devastated. Yeah. So love is more stable and reasonable. And all of our relationships are a mixture. So if we can be on top of minimizing the liar of attachment. Then when someone passes, we're left with how wonderful it was to have known them. How useful it was to have been in each other's lives. You know, you're left with the richness and the, the celebration of it. And yes, of course, sadness, but it's not that kind of um, agitated, crazy sadness, ripping your hair out kind of grief, you know, that actually is usually a sign of attachment. Yeah, so that's a bit confronting to sit with. But if you can do this by remembering your personal experience of attachment versus love over time, not necessarily related to death, you know, just do it in a gentle way with kind of moderately important relationships in your life to give yourself back this knowledge, yeah, to reinforce the truth that you know, because then it will protect you when you really need it. Yeah, so those two, um, forms of impermanence meditation, just looking at raw change or looking at love versus attachment through the lens of impermanence. This can just kind of get us into the right letting go mindset. Yeah, so that's pretty straightforward, but if you have any questions about that, we can talk about it for a second before I go into the eight stages. Do you guys have any questions about using impermanence to help you let go or to protect your mind? Clear enough, just a matter of doing it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then we have um, going into the eight stages. So um, there's the physical process, and then there's the internal signs, and both of them are really important to get familiar with. So of all the things we're talking about in terms of preparing for death, the eight stages is the most important in, in terms of really making sure that your mind 
doesn't get startled or freaked out by something that is a natural process. And even more than that, can lean into the opportunity that comes at the end of that process. So that's for you. But then for others, if you're able to see some of the stages, then again, you're not going to be shocked. You're going to be prepared. You know, they're, they're about to leave this body. And so then your um, plans are going to be a lot more um, useful. So if you get used to the physical process and the internal signs, it's much easier then to bring in what to do, what to think at each of those stages. Okay, so the physical process is just really straightforward. It's your classic elements. And basically each of the elements in your body takes a turn in giving up its support of consciousness. So remember in Buddhism, there's a difference between mind and form or physicality matter, all right? They're two different things, but your mind lives in your body right now, right? It's kind of hanging out here at the heart chakra and it's, you know, it's pervading your body, etc. but your mind and your body are not the same thing. But right now, they're completely kind of like co-mingled. When you die, um, each element absorbs or withdraws, however you want to frame it, but basically one by one they stop supporting consciousness until nothing about your body supports consciousness and your consciousness leaves, okay? So the first one to go is earth. And that basically means like all of your bones and your fleshy bits and anything kind of like hard um, teeth, you know, stuff like that, hair. Um, right now your consciousness pervades those things, but as you die, that's the first one to go. So when you're dying, you have a feeling of heaviness. Yeah, you have an impression that you're like sinking through the bed or sinking through the floor. Um, it's hard to move your limbs. The body can kind of shrink if you've ever been with someone who's dying and they just, they look smaller for some reason. Um, your eyes have trouble opening and closing, you know, and uh, your skin's shininess um, diminishes. So uh, in terms of it happening in daily life, it happens every time you fall asleep. And sometimes you've experienced this if you've been woken up at the wrong time. So not like if you wake up in the morning and you're just groggy because you had a rough night, but if you've been woken up and you feel like you can't move, if you've ever kind of been woken up in a weird way and you feel kind of like a paralysis and like your limbs are heavy, it means your consciousness hasn't kind of come back into that element. Yeah, so when you fall asleep, everything absorbs to the heart, right? And then you have your dream experience at the subtle level of consciousness um, and then you wake up and everything goes back to normal. The same process happens at death. So when we fall asleep, we don't usually catch the stages, but occasionally you can catch the first one, which is earth. And the vision, the internal vision that comes is like a mirage. Yeah, so we'll talk about the visions in a sec, but right now just the physical bits. So first is earth, you feel heavy. So if you're watching someone die and they're saying, oh, I can't even reach that glass or I'm having trouble, you know, like getting that blanket, know that that's, that's a really clear sign that perhaps the earth element is no longer supporting consciousness. Yeah, and they're gonna feel really heavy and it's gonna be really hard for them to move. Um, so you see that, then you know that, then it's easier to just be compassionate with the process rather than get distracted by logistics, you know, calling in the doctors, what's wrong, what's wrong? It's like, you know what's wrong, they're dying. You know, so now what can we do to make an environment that's calm and soothing and loving? So then we have water, and um, with water not supporting consciousness anymore, basically it's really straightforward. It's when the mouth gets really dry and papery. Um, in palliative care, the nurses are often, you know, sponging the tongue or spritzing the mouth because the mouth gets really dry, and that can be a soothing thing for folks. But um, the very, very dry mouth, dry, scratchy eyes, um, it's harder for them to hear. Um, harder for them to focus. Um, they also might not have, um, you know, as much toilet activity. Yeah, and um, basically everything related to liquid within the body, you're just kind of drying up a bit or kind of stagnating or settling. And that's the feeling. And um, sometimes they get the feeling of being like swept away. Yeah, like, um, and it can be a little bit unsettling. 
So, you know, if you're the one in the caring position, you can just be like, this is just natural. It's just natural. You're not going anywhere. Your mind is your mind. Your mind will continue forever. This is just your body. Yeah. It's just the house. <laughs> the house is, you know, kind of crumbling, but that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. You're not the house. Yeah. But um, for you as the dying person, it can be quite unsettling for people to feel that kind of wishing away feeling. And so if you're used to the concept that this happens, then you're not afraid. You go, oh, water. Yeah, right. I remembered about water. Come back to your refuge. Come back to Bodhicitta. Yeah. Then we have fire. And when fire doesn't support consciousness anymore, you feel cold. Simple as that. Um, often their feet and their hands. Of course, we get cold feet and cold hands all the time, especially you guys in the mountains. I'm sure I have cold feet right now. Don't worry. Um, but there's kind of a withdrawal from the top and from the bottom, and everything is starting to concentrate to the heart center. And um, it might be that they ask for more blankets or things like that. So just something to know that when fire doesn't support consciousness, they feel cold. So you might think, okay, there's no fire inside my body. What do you mean fire element? It's just anything that is heat within the body. Yeah. And then we have air. And um, air in this context is not just the breath, but anything to do with circulation. So the circulation of blood, the circulation of different, you know, lymph nodes or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, circulation movement within the body, as well as the coarse breath, and um, so when the air element is no longer able to support consciousness, um, then you're having this kind of um, breathing problems. Um, it's hard for them to remember details, hard for us to remember details. You know, it's it, disorienting. Yeah. Um, so then we get, um, what are we up to? <laughs> Fire, air. Yeah, um, space. So with space, um, we get the kind of 80 natural conceptions completely dissolving. And those are basically like your everyday obsessions <laughs> or your everyday train of thought. So basically at this point, um, you're already medically dead, your pulse is stopped, your breath is stopped. And what's happening is that your coarse consciousnesses have stopped functioning which sounds terrible, but is actually a great relief. Yeah, so all your like plans, all your worries, all your fears, they've just settled, yeah? They've totally settled at this point. And space gives, you know, no longer supporting consciousness, then coarse consciousness no longer is functioning, then the mind gets subtler and subtler. Okay, so that's what's happening physically. So for us as the carer, when the, when the person stops breathing and the pulse stops and they're medically dead, remember that the consciousness is still in there. Yeah. So if they are a practitioner and they've told you that they would like to be left undisturbed, the reason is so that they can continue their tuktum practice within their body because it's this amazing opportunity where the mind is no longer distracted by the senses and is no longer distracted by the coarse consciousnesses. So it's a really powerful time to practice. Um, if someone is not a practitioner, they also might be getting good work done in there and it's a great relief. Yeah, so if you can give them some space and some time to just abide in some peace, hopefully some altruistic peace, that's a nice thing to offer for folks. Um, if someone is a Buddhist but not a particularly good meditator, they might have motivated well for compassion and is also nice for, to kind of like leave them in that. Now, of course, you know, people dying in hospice or dying at home or whatever, you know, you're going to move the body probably quicker than we would in Buddhist countries. You know, in Buddhist countries, they try to leave the body at least for three days. Um, if you can, it's nice to do. It's a nice thing to offer your loved ones. But if you can't, don't freak out, right? It's not going to ruin anything for them, um, especially if they're not a practitioner. What it does is the jolt of the body moving often disrupts the consciousness and it finishes its stages and leaves the body, which is fine, right? Because the main thing was their thoughts way back at the earth element. Yeah, so if they had peace and calm state of mind way back in the beginning, that was their good, you know, like launch sequence 
for their next rebirth. So if they get disrupted out of their body kind of, you know, prematurely because they need the bed at the hospital or something like that, don't worry, it's not the end of the world, okay? But it's good to know that, you know, death is not an emergency, you know? So if someone dies at home, you know, you don't have to make a whole uh, fuss and immediately call all sorts of people. You could just let it be. If they're dead and you know they're dead and they've been dying for days, you know, you don't have to suddenly make chaos in that really beautiful space, um, in that really peaceful place. You know, um, it can be very blissful in a room where someone has just died, especially if they've died peacefully. And, you know, they might be getting all sorts of good practice done. Just kind of leave them if you can. So death is not an emergency, right? The emergencies were all prior to death. So if someone is passed, if you can try and just let it be, that's great. But if logistically you can't, don't worry. Okay. So then the internal signs, um, some of you are quite familiar with these, but if you could memorize them, Honestly, it is it's going to come in handy so much if you ever practice Tantra. It's going to come in so much handy when you die because you're not going to be freaked out and you're going to be able to stay connected to your refuge a lot easier. And when you're with people, you're going to not be freaked out if they say, hey, I see this weird shimmering. You're not going to worry about them. If you can't memorize them, it's fine. You know, they're going to happen whether you remember them or not. But if you can remember that they exist, yeah, even if you don't remember the sequence and the specifics, if you remember that when you die, there are these internal impressions that are just the natural result of your consciousness no longer being supported by various levels of elements. So, you know, when Earth is no longer functioning, you get this shimmery mirage impression to your mind. Yeah. And then when... Um, you know, in the next stage, when you have no longer water supporting consciousness, you have like a billowing smoke or steam kind of impression. And then when fire is no longer supporting consciousness, it's like fire sparks um, against a night sky or like fireflies. Yeah. And then you get like a weak red blue flame when air element is no longer supporting consciousness, you know, like a candle about to go out, like flickering. And then, and then when um, you're medically dying, it fades to white. So, you know, people with near-death experiences often talk about the experience of a white light. We would say, yes, you were medically dead, but you were still in the body. And so from the Tantra perspective, those of you that um, practice Tantra, the white is because the drop from the father is descending. More on that for people that practice Tantra. So that's interesting to know why white. And then red is the drop from the mother coming up. And so it's like an autumn sunset. And it basically, these are just signs that your mind is going more and more subtle. And after the red appearance, you go into this like black near attainment, this blackness, and it's like fainting or swooning unconscious. And that's not the end. Next is the clear light. And that's what we're really interested in. So the clear light impression is like an autumn dawn, you know, blue and radiant and spacious and clear. And you have kind of a natural non-dual experience. You kind of have a natural sense of no concrete subject and object. You know, a sort of a sense of interconnection or lack of individuation that arises spontaneously and is very blissful. And then for most people, then that just finishes, <laughs> right? And they leave the body and they're in the bardo and then they go into their next rebirth. What we wanna to try to train to do is for that non-dual experience to be recognized as a non-dual experience. So this is where studying the emptiness of inherent existence becomes really important because, you know, if you think of your meditations right now, the most distracting things at first are the senses, right? At first, when you first start meditating, you know, sights and sounds and aches and pains and stuff distract you. And then as you get to be a better meditator, what distracts you are your thoughts, right? And, um, and your thoughts will continue to be aggravating and distracting for a long time. Now, when you're dying, those thoughts and those sensory experiences just aren't there. 
So, you know, so it's like everything that you've done in your meditations during your life is going to have this clarity and this power that was so much harder to touch when you were still, you know, in a kind of coarse body living in a sort of samsaric existence. So the opportunity to bring your knowledge of the emptiness of inherent existence and place it on the experience of non-duality means that you can realize emptiness then and there. And of course, realizing emptiness directly is cutting the root of samsara. Yeah, it's something that's so important for us on our path to enlightenment. Realizing emptiness is not enlightenment, but it's one of the most fundamental sections of the path. It's one of the most profound pieces. And it means that the rest of your path is gonna go so much quicker and more smoothly. It also means you're gonna cause so much less trouble in the meantime, right? <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, what we really want to make sure is that if we're experiencing clear light mind, that we think I and my mind and everything is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. Yeah, even just that. Lama Tsongkhapa is king of reasons. It's, you know... It's a very delicate thing to think about this, this consciousness going from life to life to life, carrying its karmic seeds, carrying its habitual tendencies, you know, having a clear and knowing nature, having innate ignorance, having Buddha nature, and then not to think that that's an identity, right? It's very difficult for us, right? To think, okay, all of that is happening and it's going from life to life. How is that not an independent entity or like a soul or a spirit that's concrete and findable and a permanent core within a section of experience? But during the time of death, it's almost like the truth of things reveals itself to us, but we have to recognize it. And so far we haven't recognized it, which is why we just then keep doing the same old thing. So the clear light recognizing the clear light is an amazing opportunity at death. So if we can train in doing that, we're really um, going gangbusters with our practice. Okay, so study emptiness, meditate on emptiness, apply that awareness of emptiness to your own I, your own self, to your own mind, to anything you identify with. It's going to help, right? But it's particularly going to come in handy at the time of death. Also, remembering emptiness is one of the quickest antidotes to all of your negative states of mind, right? All of your negative states of mind have their own specific antidote, but what antidotes all of them is remembering emptiness, right? So take, for example, anger, right? You're angry at someone or something, and you could meditate on patience, and you could meditate on love, and that will definitely protect your mind from anger or help soothe the anger that's already arisen. But if you remember, I lack inherent existence, the person I'm angry at lacks inherent existence, the drama unfolding between us lacks inherently inherent existence, because all three of these dependently arise, it becomes very hard to decide who is at fault. And you just drop it, right? So just keep this idea that remembering emptiness is useful in so many areas in immediate daily life, in ongoing spiritual practice and at the time of death. Yeah, so even though it's intellectually can be a little bit difficult, it's still really worth our time. Yeah, and even a very bare basic understanding of the lack of inherent existence helps so much just in your daily life. Yeah, so just kind of like if you've been putting off studying emptiness, kind of give yourself a boost and say, I must come back to it. Even if it's hard, I need to understand it. It's going to come in handy. Okay. All right. So what to do and think at each stage, spiritual refuge connection, universal altruism, and of course, emptiness as a bonus, of course, as a main thing if you can, but at least these two, your refuge and altruistic motivation, i.e. bodhicitta. These are the main things that are going to help water all of your positive seeds to help you for a positive rebirth. Yeah. Okay. So um eight stages questions <laughs> thoughts it's um the eight stages are all in your um course materials if you got lost at all would you like to do the meditation nod wave <laughs> some waves yeah okay, okay. 
And um, I've got some recordings of it as well. So if, um, if this one isn't your style, there's lots of variations, but let's just kind of go through it really briefly and kind of see, see what to do. Yeah. So just get yourself a good straight back, nice meditation posture. Just kind of let go a little bit of kind of conceptualizations and, you know, lots of ideas floating around, but just see if you can kind of gently disengage from those and bring yourself to something physical. For example, the weight of yourself in the chair. And just ground yourself. Thinking my consciousness right now is safe and happy here in my body. But even when I don't have this body, I will still have a consciousness. And so I'm going to meditate on the fact that this consciousness will leave this body. And the reason I'm meditating on this is so that I use this process to facilitate my spiritual development so that I can be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings. And so then think that today is the day that you die. After this class, you'll have time to tie up a few loose ends because this is a nice friendly meditation. But then you're going to go to bed and you're going to die tonight. And just imagine that that might be the case. In the very clothes that you're wearing now, you didn't even have time to change. You got home and flopped on the bed and then felt this incredible heaviness And it was tricky to see. You felt kind of a weird dullness or a film over your eyes. And then to your mind's eye, there appeared a mirage shimmering. And in the back of your mind, you remember, this is the first stage of death. This consciousness is about to leave this body, but it'll find a new one. Right now I need to focus on my path. And so you think I take refuge from the depths of my heart in the ideals of loving kindness and compassion. This is what I want internally. This is what I want to share externally. And then if you're Buddhist, you can think the purpose of my life is to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. May whatever happens next facilitate that process. And you become aware of a dry mouth, kind of a furry tongue. It's not pleasant at all. You might be really thirsty. And then you have a vision internally of billowing smoke. And instead of becoming alarmed or curious, you just think, oh, it's just death. I've died so many times. This time, may I use the opportunity. And so as you see billowing smoke, you think, may whatever comes next facilitate my spiritual path. May I be of benefit to others. And you notice that you can't really smell and you're a bit cold. 
And instead of being worried about that, you just think it's just the body. It's just form. It just means the fire element isn't supporting conscious anymore. It just means I need to remember my path. You see a vision of sparks flying up. And you think, may I be of benefit to all sentient beings. May love and compassion prevail. And then you stop being able to move. And it's hard to remember what was important or wasn't important in this life. All your old motivations fade. And you have a vision of a flickering flame as the air element is no longer able to support consciousness. You see that flickering flame and you're not worried. You just remember this is the dying process. May I continue my spiritual path. And then comes radiant white and to the outside world you have died, but your internal world is very peaceful. You see white and feel no pain. All the worries, all the plans gone, all the sensory distractions gone. And with this wide appearance, think that part of your mind remembers to stay connected to your spiritual refuge and your strong motivation to be of benefit to all. You see white and think that. And white turns to red like an autumn sunset, filling your mind's eye. Your mind becomes even more subtle. As you see this redness, you remember the clear light is coming. May I recognize the empty nature of my mind, its lack of inherent existence the fact of its dependent arising. May I use this opportunity to continue my spiritual path. And red turns to black and it's like you fainted it's just blackness and peace. But think that part of your mind remembers the clear light is coming. May I recognize the nature of mind. May I cut the root of samsara. May my path to enlightenment progress. For all sentient beings, for all sentient beings, for all sentient beings. And then from the black comes the blue, radiant, autumn-like dawn of clear light. There is no sense of you and me or this and that. Like a space of infinite possibilities. And normally you would just enjoy this experience. 
It's so blissful, so spacious. But this time you enjoy the bliss and the spaciousness and also recognize this I is completely empty of inherent existence. And then the consciousness leaves the body and enters into the bardo, propelled by the positive karma of your past lives. In particular, a strong karmic seed of ethics and generosity, propelled by strong aspirational prayers to continue your spiritual path. And in this bardo experience, sometimes you can hear the thoughts of your loved ones. Sometimes you're drawn to your own projections, hellish figures, heavenly figures. But you see it all as your mind's projection. And you're not drawn back to your old relatives. You simply wish them well. You know you'll meet them again in other ways and other forms. And so through this Bardo experience, you let go and stay motivated to be of benefit to others. And through this dreamlike Bardo experience, your mind is propelled to new parents or to a pure land And as you take rebirth, the visions reverse. Black. Red. White. Flame. Sparks. Smoke, mirage, rebirth. And so you either become starting to form within your new mother's womb, or you're reborn from a lotus in Amitabha's pure land, but think that you carry this strong motivation to continue your spiritual path, to be of benefit to all sentient beings. And dedicate the merit of this practice to becoming enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. And relax your attention. Okay, so, um, you know, if you're doing sadhana practice, it's um, something, it's a meditation you can insert into your sadhana practice. Um, if you do succession guru yoga, you can insert it into succession guru yoga. But anytime there's uh, an instruction to, quote, dissolve into emptiness and then arise as, in that transition point, you can go through those stages and then come back out and then arise as whatever deity that you've been instructed to practice. So for those of you that don't practice Tantra, just ignore that advice. But um, those of you that do, just, you know, it's another time to reinforce the process and you can become so familiar that it just kind of goes, you know, mirage, smoke, uh, you know, flickering, or, um, sparks, flame, white, red, black, clear light, and all the way up again and out. It just can be like bing, 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 really quick on days that you're, um, you know, busy. And then days that you're not busy, you can take more time and go through it in more depth. Um, but just for those of you that do do Sedona practice, it can be useful to insert it in just to keep that familiarization really strong and forefront in your mind. And, you know, and remember that anything that you're thinking and visualizing, even though we might not be great at working on our internal energy system, 
it still has a positive effect on our internal energy system, which will give us more control and flexibility with it over time. So even if it doesn't feel like anything's happening per se, by familiarizing yourself with this process, you do become um, a lot more able um, to work with these subtle systems just over time. So it's a, it's a useful practice to give yourself. So anything about the eight stages? Got two questions, Martin. Sure. Just the first one, um, for, uh, with the six session yoga, um, saying, do you mean just do it at the end or is it somewhere during the, the reading? Yeah, with, without giving too much, giving away too much to the unempowered, it's in the um, guru is here, then Vajrasattva, that bit. Yep, in the long six session. Um, with the, the eight stages, um, can they, do they sort of, does it, does it vary with each person, like can that eight stage take a week or two days or does it happen in 10 minutes or, you know, is there a, anything written about the timing of that eight stages? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, it really varies person to person. So for some people, they can kind of be in that earth element having not um, supporting consciousness anymore, earth element dissolving stage. They can be in that for weeks sometimes. Um, sometimes people can go you know, down a few and then seem to come back. Yeah, so it's not necessarily all tidy like the list. Um, if it's a sudden death, you know, say you're hit by a bus, it just kind of goes boom, 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 just like when you fall asleep. Yeah, when you fall asleep, they just go zhook, and you're in, and then you wake up, zhook, and you're out. Yeah, that's without the sound effect. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, for some deaths, it's just kind of a real um, obvious kind of takes about three days from when they're kind of bedridden, semi-comatose to when they exit. Um, for some people, it takes a few weeks. So it really depends on what illness it is that is um, the, the cause of their death um, or the condition for their death. And um, uh, if it's natural old age or what happens, or if it's, you know, they um, die in their sleep, it all happens through that nighttime period. So there's a lot of variation is the answer. Yeah, there's a lot of variation. Yeah, any other questions about eight stages? I'm just wondering, um, should we prepare ourselves to the possibility of violent deaths or should we really veer right away from that? It could happen, right? Of course we could wind up with a violent death. I, I think, remember that basically your mind will do whatever it's habituated to do. Yeah, so how are we in a crisis right now? Some people are really steady in a crisis and it brings out the best in them. And some people really freak out in a crisis and they're generally really lovely and reasonable, but then in a crisis, they kind of freak out and get really angry or whatever. It's not a judgment, it's just a self-knowledge, right? So if you know that in the past when traumatic things have happened, that you've lost your mental clarity, it just means now is the time to reinforce things that will facilitate your mental clarity so that if there is a violent death that you're able to kind of let go of what's happening to your body and come to what you want your mind to do. Um, it's, it's difficult to say, you know, kind of disengage from the body without kind of making yourself dissociative. You know, we don't want to make ourselves dissociative whenever there's difficulty happening. But if it's death, it's like, that's the time to say, it's just the body. I wish this wasn't happening to the body, but it's not me, you know? No one can harm me. Lots of things can harm this body. But if there's anywhere to place identity, it would be on the mere eye labeled on the five aggregates, right? That's the conventional eye. And, you know, basically we're talking about the mind. And the mind is not material. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think... It's, it's worth unpacking why you might be worried about that, you know, and if there's some stuff that's gone down in the past that, that's been really rough, 
you know, really make sure you get some support for things like that. But, but just to keep remembering that even if we're hit by a bus and we don't get to do our meditation because it's just kind of all abrupt and we didn't get well motivated, your mind's going to do whatever it's habituated to do. So that's the call to get ourselves really familiar with what are the default faults we want to have in our mind. You know, it's all well and good to talk about the legacy you want to leave your friends and family in terms of skills and material things and this and that. But the legacy that you want to leave yourself is healthy mind and positive habits. You know, so however we are right now, if we were to die right now, we'd, we'd carry those habits with us, good and bad. You know, we're kind, lovely people, and we all have our neuroses, and that would be the whole thing that we're taking with us. The details would be gone, the stories would be gone, the memories would be gone, because none of us are clear enough to remember those things, probably. But the habits remain. Yeah, and the impressions and the things we're drawn to and away from remain. So we're just kind of a big bag of habits right now. And um, value and treasure the ones that are good, because we do, we have so many kind things about us. We really do want to be good people. We want to look after each other. We want to be good to the environment. We want to be kind to our pets and our families and the people around us that's worth celebrating. And we're a little bit of a nutbag as well, right? Like all of us, we have our ways you know, that are a little bit neurotic and not totally functional. And we, we kind of don't want to keep all of those. Um, you know, but again, remember, there is no way you can ever destroy your Buddha nature. Yeah, you can never destroy your Buddha nature. You can never destroy your potential to become enlightened. So, you know, you think if even cockroaches can become enlightened eventually, or even Hitler can become enlightened eventually, why not me? You know, <laughs> I'm not doing so bad comparatively, right? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just um, bring up a couple other points that are um, more kind of logistical. Um, and then uh, you guys can break for lunch. So um, it's logistical, but of course it's profound internal logistics. Um, but if you kind of want to keep it light, because there's been a lot of content today, thinking just more strategically, old grudges or guilt. Yeah. Thinking of them logistically and as a project of remember these things that you push aside, they often do roar to the surface if you have kind of a, a death that goes over a few weeks or if you have an illness, often these things come up. And so sort it out now while you're still clear and sharp. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, just you're asking yourself basically what secular or spiritual practices will heal, yeah, or might heal. Yeah, it's just a question to ask yourself, you know, what might work? You don't know for sure, or maybe you do know for sure, but to start asking the questions, first of all, do I have old grudges? Do I have old wounds? Do I identify as, you know, someone who has been wronged or someone who has been harmed? You know, it's, it's useful to kind of check in about that because um, it's not going to help facilitate the path unless you decide to take it on the path. Um, and then on the other side, you have guilt and regret, you know, have you done the wrong thing in the past and not really addressed it, you know, through therapy, through purification, through forgiveness work, you know, it's like it might not be actively eating you or it might be, but it might really come to the forefront as you die. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's worth sitting with it. Um, death is not going to wait for you to make peace with everything. And remember that the people that you have strong karmic connection with, negative or positive, those connections keep happening, right? You have like a magnetism karmically with people. So if you've had big issues, you're probably going to bump into each other again and again. You might as well sort it out now if you can, at least sorting out your side of it at least a bit more. You know, it's, it's, it's a worthwhile mental investment because it's not like you're going to escape your difficult relationships just by changing bodies. You'll just bump into them again. Yeah. So secular stuff, you guys know this, but just to kind of like refresh, um, counseling is not bad, <laughs> right? Um, there's a forgiveness practice in your course materials that I find really useful to walk myself through either as an analytical meditation or as a journal exercise if I'm really grumpy with someone. 
Yeah, especially if someone has really hurt someone I love and I'm having trouble forgiving them. It's a really um, useful process. So that one um, I really recommend. And, um, you know, then we have, um, let's see. So, yeah, okay, coming back to counseling, um, there can be an illusion in Buddhist circles that if you're Buddhist, you're kind of like beyond therapy because psychotherapy is so, uh, so much lower than the amazing concepts and philosophies within Buddhism. It's a common thought that people think. And it's not completely untrue. You know, Buddhism does have very sophisticated philosophy and very sophisticated techniques for achieving mental health and not just mental health, but mental development and spiritual progression all the way to enlightenment. But it's very common to find people that jump over some basic mental health stuff on their way to trying to get into Buddhist ideas. So if you've noticed that, okay, you know, you're good at patience and you're good at loving kindness and you're kind of getting a hang of emptiness, but then you just sort of have abstract anxiety or depression that just won't leave you alone, or you have this or you have that, it's no fault to go into some therapy. And uh, this is my plead for the human race. Please get some therapy, all of us, right? Even if you're not doing too bad, it can really help. Um, the danger with therapy is that you over identify with your negative states of mind. So if you decide before you even start, I'm not going to do that, then thumbs up, full speed ahead. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, that's my um, shtick for the day. Um, journal exercises can be quite useful. Also rituals that you create. So I'm calling this secular because it's manufactured. Um, I'm a fan of not reinventing the wheel of if there's a spiritual practice that's already laid out and works, you might as well use it. But for some people, you're too much free spirits and you're too much doing your own thing. And so make a ritual. But the point is you're trying to let go of grudges, right? So some things that help, write it down, burn it, right? Classic. Another one that um, people do sometimes is they recite the story of the drama over some bird seed, right? They did this and then they did this and they did this and then you throw it and then the birds eat it and they transform it into energy for flight. So whatever kind of hippie stuff you want to get up to, if it helps you let go of stuff, do it. Yeah. If it helps you let go of grudges, if it helps move and heal wounds, by all means, yeah make it up. <laughs> but um, so it's, it's worthwhile really looking at what's going to help because these things do keep coming up. Okay, so then spiritually, don't forget mindfulness meditation, <laughs> right? It's so basic, just focusing on the breath or focusing single pointedly on one object. But in terms of becoming more self-aware, if you get used to something as simple as you're watching your breath, then you get distracted, you notice you're distracted, and you come back to the breath. That simple, simple practice makes it so much easier for you to see that there's a difference between what you're focusing on and how you're thinking about it. And you can see how powerful that's going to be in your daily life, how much more mindfulness you'll be able to bring to the time of death. So, you know, don't underestimate the good old fashioned mindfulness meditation. Just do it with a bodhicitta motivation. Yeah. Um, clarity of mind meditation is what you'll do after lunch. And that one can really help you understand the mind in its relative sense. So then you can bring emptiness meditation to that. So understanding the emptiness of the mind, meaning its lack of inherent existence. It's helpful to get a handle on what is the mind. Besides all the sensory stuff, what is the main mental primary consciousness like? So that um, clarity of mind meditation um, you're going to do after the break. Then analytical meditations, of course, you got your classics, right? Loving kindness, equanimity, patience, dependent arising impermanence. And those guys are in your course materials. The reason I mention it here is just to kind of take a minute and get on top of what on earth are you hanging on to? Yeah. Like, don't let it just sit there and eat you. Yeah. What are your wounds? Yeah. Let's, let's start kind of making a project out of soothing and finding some peace and transforming. Yeah. Then the other side of course is guilt and regret. So, um, 
we've all done the wrong thing. Maybe we've dealt with the fact that we've done the wrong thing and maybe we haven't. Um, maybe therapy or purification will help, right? So if you go into some therapy, they're probably gonna ask you things like, where did it come from? But more importantly, why do you hang on to it? Sometimes guilt is a punishment we give ourselves as a permission not to change sometimes, yeah. Um, so it's worth digging into some of that. Of course, from a Buddhist perspective, guilt and regret, you know, there's no word in Buddhism for guilt, but there, because Tibetans think it's nonsense, why would you do that to yourself? But regret is actually quite healthy. Yeah, you know, thinking, oh, that was a mistake. I should stop that, <laughs> right? Just clean, clear, not identified as your mistake. Just identifying the mistake. Very important distinction. So you can do it through Vajrasattva practice or 35 Buddhas, etc. But the main point is that with any purification, you've got the four opponent powers, right? And remember that the four opponent powers are like the ingredients that make the negative karmic seeds unable to produce suffering, right? So the imprints will still remain until you're realizing emptiness on and on, but they can't give you suffering anymore if you do the four opponent powers, particularly with Vajrasattva. So I know Venerable Paldron um, leads some Vajrasattva practices sometimes. So if you're not used to the practice enough that you can lead yourself through it, I'd really recommend going to one of hers or, um, or checking out online because it's a really important practice. Okay. So the point is to plan, okay? <laughs> These issues won't magically resolve over time. This is, the, this is kind of the rough, kind of getting the foundation stabilized. Next week, my, my plan is to look more into specific practices, um, both for preparing for your own death and for after, um, helping other people in the transition periods. So um, what do you think? Do you want to look more into grief or do you want to look more into Buddhist practices or a bit of a combo? Where are you guys at? Grief or practice or both? Both. You reckon both? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, no. okay, no. so your homework, should you choose to accept it, totally optional, is look at the handout about designing your own funeral and start designing your own funeral. <laughs> okay, it can be really positive and useful. Yeah. yeah, but you don't have to if you don't want to. I'm not going to check. <laughs> okay. So um, have a lovely break, and, um, and then the next session I recorded for you, it's getting late here in Montana, so it's sleepy time for me, but I left you a session. So um, Craig will put that online for you guys, and um, a clarity of mind meditation as well. Are there any um, last minute questions before we say goodbye for now? Or um, anything you particularly want to make sure that we cover next week? Um, Yunjin, um, I would really like to cover um, practices with people who are not Buddhist, because my mother um, is yes, actually yeah. probably, you know, um, not dying yet, but will be, and it's quite a fraught relationship anyway, but she is very tense, and very tense about anything spiritual, so calming her mind will be interesting, will, will be, yeah, I can't even imagine how I would begin yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'll bring some of those those ones that we do for Karuna hospice patients who aren't Buddhist at all, just so you have it in your tool belt if it seems appropriate. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I think that's the case for a lot of us that the people that will be companioning won't have a yeah, spiritual practice or won't be Buddhist or, you know, I think that's really useful. So yeah, I'll make sure we do some of that. Um, I'll write a note. Um, anybody else, any stuff you want to make sure that we cover next time? Uh, the same sort of thing in terms of funeral planning. Mm. People there are not going to be even remotely Buddhist. Yep, 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 funeral stuff for the non Buddhists, gotcha. That's still going to help facilitate the process in a good way. Yep. Sure. Okay. All right, well, um, you got it, um, and I'll see you next Saturday. Same bat time, same bat place. <laughs> and um, we'll just take a minute and uh, dedicate the merit.
May all of the energy we put into these thoughts, discussions, and meditations lead to the development and awakening of our mind to its utmost extent for the benefit of all sentient beings. Thank you, Venerable. Thanks, guys. That was wonderful, Yunjin. Thank it you. Was. Thank you. It's lovely to see you guys. I miss you guys. Love you guys. <laughs> Bye. Thanks again.